Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 76. Boo. 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 I hope it's 76. Aye, it could be. That's just what I've said Let's it is. Let's go with that. Let's make it that. How are you, Nick? I'm all right. <laughs> you a little tired? A little tired. A little tired. A little tired. It's all good fun. Oh, busy weekend. Busy week. Lots of children. They're lovely, but my God, they run around a lot. <laughs> <laughs> they demand a lot of attention. I love them dearly, but stop running around. <laughs> I've also I'm not heard... built for running and playing football. <laughs> yes, you are. You just choose not to. <laughs> You're more likely you need to bring a wing back chair into yeah. the, onto yeah. the football I'll tell, pitch. I'll tell bedtime stories. I'm, I can do that. <laughs> the terrifying bedtime stories. <laughs> well, it was my birthday yesterday. Was it? Oh, crap. Yes, you were there. And yes, I got extra cocktails when I didn't need extra cocktails, but they were good cocktails. Everyone well, always needs extra cocktails. The, the joy of um, the joy of my birthday, not only just the joy of my birth, but <laughs> was that Emma from Real Life Ghost Stories finally got to try a cocktail with chartreuse in it and understood how <laughs> bad it is. Only because she was very, very wrong. And another friend tried it and went, oh, oh. They both had the same reaction of, what is this? What is this monstrosity? That's because they're both heathens, <laughs> I say. I think your palate gets used to it because the one that was made special for me, I was like, actually, you know what? It's not bad. It's it's Lots a of good thing. Nick is just tired and also disturbed the fact that I'm just sitting here wearing a t-shirt because I got a tan done and he knows he can come around and go, oh, I'm just wearing a big t-shirt. It's fine. I've wearing seen you in a t-shirt before. <laughs> yes, but nothing else. <laughs> not even wearing underwear, Nick. My God! <laughs> Thank God there's a table in the way. <laughs> Any poisonings this week? Uh, my eyes, apparently. <laughs> That's for later. <laughs> if the story starts to dip, I'll just lift the t-shirt up. And then it'll be three hours of screaming. <laughs> That's it's all for, for you everyone. to edit. <laughs> Yay. Well, speaking of poisoning your eyes and taking your top off in front of friends to upset them, I think it's time for us to thank our lovely Patreon subscribers. We should indeed. They are marvellous. They're very, very sexy. Thank you so much to Barbara A. Modesty. Thank you, Summer. Thank you to Emily Rigby. Thank you, Molly Van Overhill. To Dana Schuler Drummond. Oh, excellent, excellent mm. Patreon names this week. Love you guys. You're all very, very sexy and we love yes, you very much. Thank you. It's and this week's Patreon. Oh, oh, you've got not one, not two, but three Ooh, stories. Very dramatic this week. Our first little compendium. And yeah. my God, it worked. I like that. I'm going to do that again. Yes. Probably quite a lot. <laughs> I, I was editing it and just going, this is brilliant. <laughs> Why have we never thought of doing this before? Three great stories for the price of one and all the banter with it. The excitement yeah. level just stayed high Ooh. all the way through. It was good. Yeah, obviously it didn't dip. It was just like, oh, what's coming next? We didn't even need Negronis. <laughs> if you want to know what the hell we're talking about, you know, you need to get on to Patreon. For but $5 a month, you can do an annual subscription and you can bow out anytime you need to, but you get all of the back catalogue of Patreon goodness and lots of new episodes in the future. So we have a little shout out this week uh, from Claire Hossack, one of our lovely, delicious Patreon subscribers. Uh, Claire and her partner Andy are getting married on Saturday the 21st of August. They have had to postpone their wedding from August last year. They've both been working for the NHS on the front line through the pandemic. They completely deserve a shout out. Have the best day in the world. Absolutely. Drink all the cocktails for you. They're going to become Mr. and Mrs. Senior. I don't know if that's their surname or they've just made up a new surname. <laughs> I want something different. Or they smashed the two names together and it ended up a senior. That's great. So it was Mr. Sen and Mrs. Yu. Congratulations, guys. Have an amazing day. We hope you, as obviously is tradition with all wedding shout outs, we hope you are listening to the Poison's Cabinet down the aisle. Absolutely. It's the um, only way. <laughs> have a great day, guys. Well, Nick, are you ready? Uh, no. No? No, I'm not. No? I'm not ready. To drink cocktails and talk about poison? Uh... Or oh, we could drink poison and talk about cocktails. <laughs> no, I think we should probably have a cocktail. Give you, the people what they want. <laughs> give them what they want. It's my story this week, Nick. That is so true. hurray, hurray, hurray! Hurrah for that, indeed. And as you know, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. No such thing will be possible. You can just sit and drink, and <laughs> I will tell the lovely people a story. <laughs> He's so tired. People. Oh God, I'm so tired. <laughs> it's like watching a five-year-old about on the verge of a tantrum. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, it so is. I don't know how this episode's going to go. Nick <laughs> might just go, shut up halfway through this. I'm done with life. <laughs> it's going to be fine, Nick. It We're will. Here. It'll be good and exciting and lovely and marvellous. Well, it's my story this week, which means I got to choose the secret ingredient. As yeah. you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell that will flavour our cocktail of the week. So, my story, my pick, mm. and I went for a biggie. You did indeed. We haven't had it before. No. London Dry Gin. Yeah, I mean, it's a Yay! it's a classic. I'm surprised we haven't done it until now. Well, we have done bathtub gin. We so, have, that is so true. gin has appeared. Has appeared. It but... has appeared many times. <laughs> <laughs> gin has appeared in all of the cocktails. <laughs> but finally, this is the ingredient, and it's very fitting for this story. Well, I should hope so. Yes, yes. Nick still doesn't know what it is. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's always a very meta moment, actually, when recording this, because everyone has seen the title of this This episode. is true, actually. Everyone knows before I do. <laughs> but it's a good ingredient well, for this is. story. That it couldn't is. be anything other than London Dry Gin this week. Nick, London Dry Gin. <laughs> the greatest gin of them all. <laughs> what have you come up with? Oh, I mean, so many options. What? What couldn't I not have done? I don't, what? I don't know. That made <laughs> that made no sense. In <laughs> what couldn't I not have done? What couldn't yes. I not have not have done? Yes, maybe. Do you not like me? Maybe. <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> Pretty much. Yep. The Negroni is working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shutting down various parts of my brain. <laughs> I'm like... just clogged with Campari. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, so many, 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 many options mini, mini, with mini. with London Dry. I um, mean, the Negroni. We know I have a Negroni, and that has gin in it. Could make a gin and tonic. They're quite nice. Oh, they're tasty. Yeah, they're yeah, good. I like those. I like those. But they're but we've had them before. Mm-hmm. So I thought we we probably should do something that we haven't had before. And there's a number of gin based cocktails that I love, and I make a lot at home mm. that we haven't done yet mm-hmm. um, on the episode. But I thought, no, we're going to do something new. Could be dreadful. Who knows? Well, I'm we'll glad that out. you've. I'm glad that you've gone with something new. Yeah, because absolutely. that's exciting. People yeah. want to hear something new, a different kind of cocktail. But guys, you always have the Negroni backup. Well, the Negroni backup. You have a Casino Number One, the classic loveliness. Oh. Last word. Well, again, oh. one of the best cocktails in the world. Okay, so with <laughs> London Dry Gin, what have you come this up with? This week we are having an old friend. Oh. Having an old friend. Having an old dinner. friend. For having dinner. an old friend for dinner. Oh, an old friend. We're having an old Never heard friend. of. No, neither indeed. Neither Interesting. Are I. It's gin, so it's, it's in everything. Yeah, pretty much. But, but this, this is on, say, my Bible of Differs, is one of their top 20 gin cocktails in the history really? of the world ever. Really? Well, this is exciting. I think it's time for us, without further ado, to go into the Poisoner's Cabinet Kitchen and shake up Storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. Nick, an old friend has an come old to visit. friend has come to visit. I'm here for it. Wow, well, we'll no, see okay if they're it. welcome to stay. <laughs> or if they get thrown out the window. Indeed. Well, it's a very beautiful colour. It's a lovely colour of an old friend. Now, what colour would we call this? I would call it peachy, pinky sort of colour. Yeah, it's very... It's not quite neon pink, but it, no. it's very pink. Has it's very pink. pink. Does it have a pinky, pinky, orangey, peachy hue? What? A pinky, orangey, pinky, or, a pinky peachy, orangey hue. A pinky, orangey, peachy hue. It's, it's really lovely. Now, if Difford say this is in the top 20... This is in the top 20 gin-based cocktails. And we could mention 20 gin-based cocktails easily. So I think there's nothing left for us to do but dive in. Indeed. Let's give it a go. Dive in. Let's go. Merry Christmas. Merry okay. Christmas. Ooh, okay. Okay. Interesting. I have to say, not overly lovely. I don't know. There's a lot going on. There's some complex flavours going on there. It's very sour. It's very bitter on the first taste, but interesting. Not off-puttingly. Ooh. <laughs> oh, well, oh, 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 is, a second, is it a second sipper? Is it a third sipper? Is it a Negroni, yeah. basically? Hang on. Oh. Once you get that over and that initial shock, of it, it's actually quite oh bitter. Oh my God, yes. It's actually quite delightful. <laughs> it's the same principle as a Negroni. Okay. Oh, oh no, actually, yeah. yeah. Go with that. The are coming through. Absolutely. The, that's, yeah. that's growing on me a lot. That's, that's, that's yeah. getting there. That's getting sexy. That's yeah, getting sexy. getting good. All right, you need to talk us through it, Nick. Okay, well, well give, me, give me a guess. Apart from, like, Gin. Yeah. So you know that one. <laughs> okay, I'm going to guess grapefruit. You are absolutely correct. I venture there's something else there in is, there. Are, there are two if something else is. So we have a base of gin. Then, yeah, we have some grapefruit juice. Mm-hmm. We have some Campari. Oh, okay. Which is, again, adding to the bitterness Yes, but uh, what what has changed? Elderflower. No! And I know you're not a fan no! of that either, but a bit of elderflower, the Saint-Germain. As I said, perfume, there's no. something floral there without it being overpoweringly elderflower-based. No, once you get over that initial hit of 
bitter. Any that's Campari gone now. drink sort of has that. Oh, that's really tasty. Really lovely. Definitely. That is a Give it a go. You see, your venture dad did something new. That's a good summer drink as well. Yeah, absolutely. We are allegedly coming towards a heat wave. <laughs> Every time it's summer. I mean, Trust <laughs> us, it's a heat wave. Spend your money on tourism in the UK. <laughs> it's a good garden drink. Surround yourself with elderflower. That's a great drink. Yeah, well no, done, well. Nick. Hurrah for me. So what makes London Dry Gin different from regular gin? So London Dry is created, I believe, in London. Oh. But it is a particular style and set of botanicals that go into making London Dry. So it doesn't have to be made in London. Unlike many things like champagne and stuff that has mm. to be made in champagne to be called champagne. London Dry, you can make it anywhere in the world. But as long as you stick to this sort of specific set of herbs and spices and things to flavour it, you can make a London Dry. Mm. So there you go. That's London oh, Dry London Gin dry. for you. Well, with our old friends in hand, we're holding hands with them. Oh. Are you ready for a story? Yeah. Ah, well, Nick, Nick, mm. Nick. Today we have a grim tale of murder most foul. They usually are. Mm. Grim Dickensian slums and more gin than is probably wise. <laughs> this is a tale that is a little bit of a continuation of a story Ooh. that we did a few weeks ago. A very famous story, the Dale of Burke and Hare, because who doesn't know about them? They're fabulous. And if you don't know about them, go back and listen to the episode, and then you will know about them. This week, we are going to tell the tale of an entirely new band of body snatchers and grave robbers, the London Burkers. So two things that I will say to caveat this episode. Do listen to the end, because we've got something a little bit extra for you in this episode. The resources on this case are surprisingly light in comparison to Burke and hair but there was an excellent book that i really recommend called the italian boy by sarah wise she has done a huge amount of research and it's a really enjoyable book to read so i'd say definitely read that if you want to know more about this story all credit to her so do check out her book if you want to know more about this case so for context people a few weeks ago we did tell the tale of the notorious burke and hare a pair of ne'er do wells who turned to murder in order to cash in on the increasing demand for dead bodies for anatomy students and teachers during the 1800s. Now, they operated in Edinburgh, and this was a time of huge interest in (laughs) anatomy, basically. Huge interest. Huge interest. Now, as we've covered in previous episodes, the 19th century was a prime time for anyone who was in the body snatching and grave robbing (laughs) game. The 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 demand has tailed off slightly. It has. And it's a little sad. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But yes, if you're into the killy killy selly body dealing ways, <laughs> then this was the time for you. <laughs> But with the advent and advancement of pathology and the teaching of anatomy in medical students, suffice it to say that the demand for fresh corpses with universities and medical Mm. schools was reaching a peak, (laughs) shall we say, in the 1800s, particularly the 1810s, 20s and 30s. They knew how to have a good time. They did. They did. That is a good day. Absolutely. That is a good day. And not just anatomy students, like dancing teachers, they needed them, (laughs) like amateur dramatics, needed a lot lot of dead bodies. Andram. The best universities and private anatomists were only too happy to pay good money for a good dead body. And they wouldn't ask <laughs> What's questions. What's a bad dead body? Well, they did judge the dead bodies. You would have, and you will, you will hear in this okay. story, that the anatomists and the schools wanted particular kinds of bodies. Because if you're getting, well, let's just say that you're getting 80-year-old man through yeah. time and time and again, I mean, it. It sounds grim, but you're going to need some women. You're going to need some children. This is true. You're going to need more samples yeah, to go yeah, through. Absolutely. And so they would come and they would judge the bodies so they then, and say, yeah, this, this what I need. they need for their particular studies that week. It goes without saying that murder is still very much illegal at the time. <laughs> but as we know, grave robbing and body snatching was not illegal this at all. True. Because taking the dead wasn't illegal because technically they belonged to no one. So yes, you could steal a body. The law decreed that the only bodies that could be submitted to medical studies or to science had to be the bodies of murderers. Murderers who were hanged. Those were the only ones. Mm. Uh, Later on, vaguely suicide, but anyone who died of natural causes, absolutely not. They were not allowed to be dissected. So that's why you have this massive undercurrent and underworld operation. The story of Burke and Hare, who murdered drunken down and outs in Edinburgh and sold them on to Dr. Knox, had sent shockwaves throughout the UK and beyond. Everyone was horrified that people could stoop so low for a handful of coins. But did the case of Burke and Hare change the law? No. 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 I'm sure it gave a lot of people ideas as well. 
Well, it gave, it didn't do anything. Attempts have been made for many years to put into some sort of reform to prevent grave robbing by allowing more than just the bodies of condemned prisoners and, and the murderers to be used on the slab. But legislation continually stalled. So there's no legislation against grave robbing. Who cares if two stupid men in Scotland had been caught red-handed? This is a booming business. And if anything, Burke and Hare's actions positively inspired mm. others to try their hand at death dealing. This is reported across newspapers, across the country. So yes, you are going to pick Pick up tips and they are not the only people selling dead bodies no, they're going to learn from their mistakes and they're going to try and pick up tips of what you should be doing especially as the papers are re reporting every incident and going oh they got caught because of this reason then the next person goes well i won't do that then <laughs> no, i won't do that then <laughs> so come with me now nick come with me now to the to london town to <laughs> london we have moved on from edinburgh and the ways of burke and Hare. this is three years later and we are in the grim, godless wasteland that is Bethnal Green. Oh, godless indeed. Oh, oh, God, disgusting place. <laughs> Very trendy now. Yeah. Crucial thing to remember about Burke and Hare is that they were not resurrection men. No. They murdered people to sell on, but they were not grave robbers. They were not handling dead bodies beyond when they decided to start killing people or just someone had died in the lodging house. They didn't dig up people. They didn't do anything like that. So they're often called grave robbers and it's wrong. But in London in 1831, grave robbing is all the rage, I tell you. <laughs> well, a lot of dead people. Indeed. So. Lots of dead people means you need lots of pairs of hands. So mm -hmm. you've got gangs. You have got gangs operating in London, people who had different contacts. You need people to transport the dead bodies. You need people to talk to the universities. You need people who are willing to go and do nefarious deeds to get the dead bodies. <laughs> it's a system. And so all these gangs are operating across the city, supplying fresh corpses to the hospitals and the schools for as much money as they could get. So we covered some of the tricks about grave robbing in the last episode. A couple of new tricks, the snatchers used back in the day. We know that gangs would linger outside workhouses and slums if they heard tale of anyone who was dying. They would also get women to pose as grieving widows to go in there and just go, Irving, Irving, oh no, my poor Irving. I know I haven't turned up at all beforehand, but he was my favourite brother, father, son. I shall take him home. So yeah, people, the men would turn up pretending to be relatives. They would send women in because they got mm. more sympathy. Honestly, the workhouses didn't give a shit. Yeah, they get it. It's get one less problem for them to deal with. So. Exactly. They don't want to pay for a funeral because yeah. if they have the body, they have to pay for a funeral. As a pauper's <laughs> grave as it is, it still costs you money. And they're like, oh, help yourself. Yeah, That's go for it. I got loads people. here. Do you want them? The gang have regular suppliers. And they have nice, tidy arrangements to ensure that no one's going to tell the authorities about what's happening. You know what? You supply me the bodies. Coins will change hands. It's going to be fine. It's going to yeah, be fine. fine. It's just no one needs to know about how they were obtained. I'm not sure, and I kind of hope they did, that Body Snatchers had some sort of rudimentary catalogue. Go around and say, hello. Yes, because they had suppliers. Because medical schools had regular suppliers they worked with. And so whether they were catalogues or sample bags... <laughs> uh, that they were showing. Now, you could go for the deluxe model. This is wrapped in cling film for guaranteed freshness. <laughs> well, so we'll say, like, oh, I need a man in their 40s. Mm. And they go, okay, or, um, and that will cost you this much money. Yeah. But a man in your 80s, there's loads of them. That's going to cost you a little bit, a little bit less. <laughs> <laughs> it would be good if they could have done that, yeah, if they could guarantee right. the supply. Honestly, these body snatchers were rocking up with any fucking thing <laughs> that they could. And they would go from school to school, from university from new university, to private oh. teachers saying do you need this body and they they could legitimately turn them away and say actually sorry we've got enough got we've enough, got enough <laughs> male, white males and i've taken enough from you and they would do a certain rate and there was a kind of an understanding of what the rate of a body was but you know we're in gang territory aren't mm. we so that sort of leads to mob rule in a way <laughs> The competition for corpses is very, very strong. There was a report in the Times in 1831. A gang of ne'er-do-wells broke into a private home where a grieving family were holding a wake for an elderly relative. Mm -hmm. And they stole the body from the house and dragged it through the streets. Nice. Yeah. Subtle. Yeah. Subtle. Just yeah. broke in. That's ours now. Off they went <laughs> down the road. Okay. Gangs who had arrangements with schools to supply corpses could get very angry if you tried to switch suppliers or... They could say, you know what, I need an extra guinea. Guinea a body, you know, up the prices. You know, the schools were seemingly decent people. 
going, no, this is, this is extortion, this is awful. There was another gang called the London Borough Gang who demanded a pay increase from St. Thomas's Hospital. And when they were refused, the gang broke into the anatomy theatre while a lecture <laughs> was taking place and hacked up the corpses with knives and threatened the students. Nice, subtle. Just slicing them to pieces so they couldn't be used. <laughs> another incident, another surgeon who refused to give his supplies a wage increase that they demanded. <laughs> the gang placed carved up bodies on the street around his house. Yeah, that's very God fathery in the dark <laughs> and people are tripping over the bodies nice and crying and screaming and the surgeon was targeted he was people threw stones through his window don't get on the, the wrong side of them well you're the kind of person who's going to dig up corpses for a living mm. or just steal them from their loved one's hands so once again we have to reconcile ourselves with the fact that grave robbing just happened it just <laughs> happened a lot more than you would possibly imagine all the time everywhere but of the grave robbing gangs that operated across the capital the so-called london burkers also known as the Bethnal Green Gang, were amongst the best. The head honchos of this band were John Bishop and Thomas Williams. They worked with various associates, including James May and Michael Shields. They had various people who would help them out. John Bishop and Thomas Williams would later be known as the main head operators. Dudes. Mm -hmm. the head The head dudes as head well. Head dudes, yes. yeah. Now, unsurprisingly, not much is known about their childhood. <laughs> we do know that John Bishop had, had quite one. a... But he yes. had a childhood. He had a childhood. It was quite a grim start to life. His mother died when he was quite young. His father had a successful carting business. Very nice. good, very good. Yeah. After his first wife's death, he remarried twice more. You know, was successful-ish businessman. You know, certainly not middle class or upper mm. class at that time. But he was hit by a carriage on the road and he had to have both legs amputated. Ooh, that's going to be difficult carting with yeah, no legs. Yeah, and then he died two weeks later. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So, so, so not so business. great. John inherited the carting business. He was not great at business. But he, now, he now had carts, so... Well, Andy. he just wasn't good at operating many carts <laughs> or keeping the books for it. He was much more interested in drinking, in just taking whatever profits came in, getting drunk and having a lot of fun with his stepmother, Sarah. Yeah. Third stepmother, he and her not only hooked <laughs> up, but would marry later on. Didn't go down well. No, I can imagine not. No. That's, a, that's a complicated relationship. Yes, the locals in this very slummy <laughs> part of London are going, even we draw yeah, the line there. Yeah, there are limits. There really are. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> As the money from the carting business dwindled and he drank his way through it, John was also happy earning a living in a variety of other very respectable jobs. Mm. Uh, an informant for the police. Respectable, yeah. Very good. Uh, giving false evidence in court for people who need an alibi. <laughs> Excellent, yeah. A few coins. I will totally say oh, yeah, you I was were there, there we, we when We were I said in bed, that. absolutely, yep. We, we were in bed all day. I saw you on the bridge not stabbing anyone. <laughs> uh, I think he was actually done for perjury at one point. So, oh. <laughs> a, a tiny, tiny amount of jail time, but he was, he was absolutely fine with this. And of course, his other profession was grave robbing. Mm -hmm. Selling corpses for profit. Absolutely fine. There's lots of corpses out there. Who doesn't want some of that? Now, John's neighbour in this area, which I'll come back to, was Thomas Williams. Now, he had come from a poor background, so his past is, is a little less known because, mm. again, there was no family business there that we could trace back. But he tried his hand at many menial jobs before resorting to crime. He tried to be a labourer, painter. He tried to do all these sorts of things, but he just went, oh, my God, too difficult. Crime <laughs> is the way to go. He had a variety of pseudonyms, and they were just weird variants on his name. <laughs> He just okay. went, oh, that. He had about four different ones in operations that came out in the trial. He, as many body... And many body snatchers at the time did. They never gave... They would never give their name no, while didn't have dropping off a body. Business cards printed up, so... Hello, body snatcher. Hey. <laughs> body snatcher here. <laughs> oh, the bitch snatchy needs. He... Uh, interestingly enough, he served jail time for the theft of a copper bathtub. <gasps> And those are quite good. But they look very nice. Though, uh, they, they look very smart. Yes, yes. He stole one of those. He was going to be a glass blower. Fancy. When he was in jail, apparently he learnt the trade and he, he was all set on being a glass blower. Skilled job. Skilled job. But ah, it was not to be because, of course, he fell back into his life of crime and he moved next door to John Bishop. He joined John in flogging dead bodies for cash mm -hmm. and the London burkers were born. And they were born in Nova Scotia, garden well i thought you say in nova scotia i thought that's a long way to go uh, well, you would think you would think and that sounds like a lovely place to live doesn't it doesn't it nick does it no you would be wrong oh uh, yep yeah, I, th I thought oh god no god no so this is an area in east london which is previously harvested i don't know the word for for brick clay 
Okay. So obviously they're digging through the soil. Yes, yes, yes. Let's get all the clay. Okay, we've gouged out the earth. We need to fill it in with stuff. Let's just fill it with just crap. Just rubbish. And yeah. I'm not even kidding. Literal crap. Yep, yeah, just excrement and human waste and whatever else we've just got from the sewage pipes. Just, just put this into the ground. Fill it in there. It will build some houses. Nice. We'll build some cottages. Cottages which may have been shacks that they expanded on. And that was Nova Scotia Garden. Oh, it's, I mean, it sounds delightful. <laughs> so beautiful. So beautiful. The ground is boggy and stinking. The cottages and rickety buildings are the most undesirable and desperate people in the area will live. And it is rife with disease and crime. In this area is where Dickens based Fagin's Den. Ah, from Oliver Twist nice this is prime Dickens territory <laughs> and it's not just kind of oh it sounds a bit like Dickens Dickens actually based all of the it stuff around it it's just horrible <laughs> the good thing about it not short of pubs oh well, I mean, that's always a good thing really Which you always want yep absolutely because yes. that's what you need for if Nova Scotia was the Burkers home perhaps the gang's headquarters was the fortune of war <laughs> It's a good name. In Smithfield. <laughs> a pub that existed until I think it was about 1910. Sadly, it's not there anymore. The building and the area uh, where it was sited is is now, I think it's a corporate building. It might be a bank, actually. And I'll try and share some pictures later on. But it had set, it was originally called The Naked Boy. Okay. Which is a weird name for a pub. It is a curious name for a pub. You're, yeah. you're really setting your stall there, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> but The Fortune of War, which is a great name. It's a great name for a pub. Great gotcha. name. This was the meeting place for body snatchers nice in the body snatching age let's call it that <laughs> the, body snatch, the great age of sale the great age of, ex- of exploration the great age it's, of body snatching it is it is this is in the era as well victoria has not been born so we're not technically in the victorian era so this is actually I think the era of no name i think it's called because it's william the fourth yes what do you what would you call that I it's a know. tiny tiny period yeah, and i think i've like, read it someone said it's an era of no name but yes the body snatch, i'm gonna call it the body snatching age the body because sa- they wouldn't bloody stop the It'll gangs the gangs use several pubs to meet each other and store their bodies and this is absolutely true arrangements were made with the landlords coins were exchanged and you have a kind of a safe house the body snatchers would meet and chat and discuss what they were going to do mm. while drinking heavily through it drinking is a common three well yeah you'd have to i think oh yeah if you're pl- planning on the body snatching and the digging up of dead people i think a drink or two is probably in order yeah it's probably it's wise but you have a kind of a it's not really a safe house it's just a place and the fortune of war was one of the most popular spots for resurrectionists in north london uh, being so close to St. Barth Holloway's Hospital. Uh, right, ne- right next to it. So St. Barth's, I'll call it from now on. I was born there. Ooh. Oh. Ooh. Not in the fortune of war in St. Barth's. I was born <laughs> to a family of body bo- snatchers. I was born in the pub next door. <laughs> <laughs> that would be more fitting, I feel. It was said that there was a room in the fortune of war that was provided by the landlord with benches along the walls. This sounds quite surreal. But the body snatchers would put the corpses that they had robbed on these benches. Mm. The names of the body snatchers would be above their heads. So you knew who who was dealing right, yes, this body. Yeah. The medical students and the teachers from St. Bart's would come in and view the bodies and decide who they which ones they, which wanted. Ones they wanted. No questions asked. Just here's some bodies. We need them. And they would judge on the how fresh they mm. were. Age, sex. Well, I suppose you've got, to, you've got to view the merchandise somewhere, I suppose, haven't you? So and Why not do it with a drink? Perhaps, perhaps the landlord laid on some lovely snacks. Oh, so, oh, a nice buffet. <laughs> a nice, Don't get them confused. A nice buffet, absolutely. So, I mean, what, what drink would you have? Well, what? Well, London Dry. No, na- naked and famous. <laughs> naked and famous. <laughs> Hello. Uh, lots it of is, naked dead people. This is something that is just reported as fact. And it's one where I do go, pinch of salt, really? Oh, I don't know. Well, I mean, it's that. Or, I mean, how else? I see you are going to, like, go into the back door of the hospital with a cart full of full of bodies yes that's uh, literally what happened so no, I'm, I'm liking the in in the back room of a pub i think that's much more sophisticated the viewing room it's the view exactly so there's mm. a viewing room and as i think there's going to be some snacks um have a few drinks they buy more exactly. uh, yeah so the burkers certainly drank there regularly and they made business deals a plenty over a few pints and some of that wonderful london gin nice and it does feature up elsewhere i'm not just put that in <laughs> so bishop and williams were only too happy to deliver bodies to different schools personally they they would take bodies to the fortune of war but they would also deliver them to the schools because there's one less person to pay really at the mm, end of the day true, you don't true. need to like, exchange coins with the yeah landlord's not taking his cup now how and when the london burkers began murdering we don't know unlike with burke and Hare, where there's a very clear line that has been established with them we don't know 
because John Bishop would later boast that he had lifted at least 500 corpses in his time, and it may have been as many as a 1,000. Mm, pretty good going. Because he'd been a body snatcher for 12 years by the time he was caught. But we do know about three murders they committed, which came from both of their separate confessions later on. So October 1831, the gang chanced upon a rough sleeper named Francis Pigburn. Nice. Yes, great name. In Shoreditch. Now, Shoreditch is not the fancy place then no. that it is now. She didn't just, like, have too many avocado toasts and then fall <laughs> over, destitute from the price of all those lattes. No. no. She was a woman who was said to be heavily marked with smallpox and quite the drunkard, seen in the various pubs, drinking herself to death. When they first encountered her, she had a child Ooh. with her. She had a baby. But when they would have their final meeting, no child was there. Mm. What happened to the child? No one knows. Who knows? Nothing good, I would imagine. Nothing good. So they chance upon her one night and she is quite into her cups. But Bishop and Williams offer her a nice warm bed for the night. Maybe mm. a little, little snifter, a little snifter of gin. Maybe a little rum. How yeah. generous they are. They are. Bottle of taboo. It's all good. <laughs> they take her to Nova Scotia Gardens and she's given a drink of rum laced with laudanum. Oh, that'll do it. So a little bit of poisoning. A little bit of poisoning going on there. Yeah. Like it, like it. Yeah. Now, this is the pattern that they would repeat. Some of which you can go, ooh, cold and methodical. And other bits you go, what? The old <laughs> okay. woman drifted off. And as she fell asleep, the men went, ah, let us make sure she's asleep by going to the pub. <laughs> let us go to the London Apprentice pub okay. for a few drinks while we make sure she falls unconscious. Uh, they came back from the pub 20, 25 minutes later. Uh, she's she's passed out. Okay, okay, good. Now she's asleep from the laudanum. Now we can get on to the killing bit. And what they did is they took her outside where there is a well. They tie a cord around her feet and they drop her into the well. Well, that's an interesting method. They're gonna drown her. What they do is that they leave her in the well. They tie off the rope, so she's in what, what would be later described as the up to just about up to her feet. They describe that there's a tiny struggle. So head bubbles. first. Yeah, head first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Head for, head first in there. Tiny bubbles break on the surface. Yeah. But then they stop, no. they tie off the cord, and then they fuck off to the pub again. Well, I'll leave it out of it. So. They decide that she, they're going to leave her in there because they want the laudanum to basically come out of her mouth. They have some sort of logic of that she will, if she's dead, then she'll like just, I don't know if the that laudanum actually works will come out. Like that. No, I don't think it does. <laughs> but they just go, we'll leave her there. They just want to go and get rid They just want to go and get the pub. I mean, to be honest, I'm going to murder someone, I've just murdered someone. I think a drink is in order, either, a, a either drink side is in order. of that, to be honest, yeah. Yeah, they go out for more gym, more rum. They come back. Okay, she's definitely dead. <laughs> definitely dead. So yes. they uh, pull her out of the well, strip the body, hide the clothes. Body's bagged up, taken off to be sold to one of their private buyers for eight guineas. Later that month, a young homeless man named Cunningham was spotted sleeping rough in the pig market of Smithfield. Pig market, wonderful, wonderful place. <laughs> Again, offered a bed for the night. A lovely mug of beer. Actually, actually it's going to be beer, sugar, rum, and laudanum. That's a cocktail. Um, that's a cocktail, absolutely. That's a cocktail. Making a, we could have had that. We could have had that. <laughs> I do not know how old this person was. They describe him as a boy. The same method is used. They lace the drink with laudanum, passes out, they flick off to the pub, come back, and down into the well he goes. You would think that the doctors and people who are performing these experiments afterwards would know that this person has drowned. That their lungs are full of water. That their water. lungs are full of water and stuff. So this is not going to be a natural causes sort of death. They know something untoward has happened here. I will say it, is a, it did cross my mind reading all of the resources that I could and going, did no one point yeah. out the, the <laughs> lungs were full of water? But the body is sold another eight guineas in their pocket. Back down the pub. Sold to St. Bart's Hospital on that occasion. And the third case is the one that put them into the stratosphere of fame. Possibly the saddest. It made it the famous case because it is the murder of the so-called Italian boy. Carlo Ferrari had reportedly been seen around London many times. A boy of anywhere between 13 and 15 years old. Fair-haired, olive-skinned teenager. He would stand on the streets of Smithfield with a cage of white mice showing the animals to passers-by and begging for a few coins. Now this is a bit of a grim racket of the criminal underworld at the time where crime bosses wanted to find immigrant children because mm. they thought they looked more beautiful, yeah. they were more exotic, more yeah. put them on the street, beg and they would get them to show animals so they would give them mice so they would give them mm. whatever other animals they could get their hands on. I Elephants, don't know what else. Elephants there, um, just a cockroach, that was it. But the most beautiful children because they were 
olive skinned and tanned and they would, mm. say they would make the most money. So yeah. the children would get the money and of course it goes into the crime boss's pockets. This is what starts this furore around this last murder is the idea Bishops and Williams have killed this innocent little immigrant mm. child who's begging on the streets. So they say that they had spotted the boy at the Bell in Smithfield on the evening of the 3rd of November. They offered him lodgings and perhaps some work. He comes to the house around about 10.30pm. They call into several pubs on the way. Well, obviously. Obviously. Some do- and some call-ins, the boy stands outside not really knowing <laughs> what to do. And then they come out and go, do you want some g- gin? Gin? And they remember, oh shit, he's out. They eventually get back to Nova Scotia Gardens. Williams ensures his wife and children are asleep and they give the boy some bread, some cheese and a nice cup of rum with laudanum. As soon as he's asleep, the men spring into action. They go, go to the pub. Go to the pub. Go to the pub. They My sort have... of spring in that. It is. It's springy. <laughs> springy. They have a nice quartern, it was called, of, of gin. At the feathers. The feathers. Nice. And then they come home and they go, oh yeah, he's definitely unconscious. And the boy goes the same way goes as the others. The well. mm. Head first down the well. He is stripped of his clothes. The clothes are buried and he is bundled into a sack. Then they went for coffee. They do a lot of... They a lot of socialising and things going on there. Big expenses claim, I'm this imagining. Is they, they write this and this is from the horse's mouth. This is, we did this, then we went for coffee, then we went for drinks. They need drink constantly through this. But then coffee. Price, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> then afterwards, okay, we killed them. Maybe some coffee will help us focus. <laughs> Then more gin. It's always a good idea. They come back, they put him in a large box. And on the 5th of November, 1831, Bishops and Williams started a long day of trying to trade this body. They start drinking in the Fortune of War, talking to acquaintances, but they have to go off and sell the corpse. Bishops went back and forth to various contacts in London. He knew he'd been offered eight guineas for the body that he told people about by one contact, but he was sure he could get ten. Get ten. It's a young, beautiful, beautiful child. Ugh. Now his associate, this is where James May comes into it. You've got Bishops and Williams, but James May speaks to him and he is just a grave robber. Been selling corpses, no part in any murders. And he assures that, oh, he's found a better price. Going, okay, fine, we've got a body. We need to get a cab. We need to get the sack into this cab. No one's asking questions. Mm-hmm. Every cab driver they find, they buy them a drink. Yeah, we need to stop at this pub. Exactly. <laughs> They ping back and forth from the fortune of war all day, making arrangements to move the bodies completely wrecked by the time they are coming to, okay, okay, I think we've found some. Do they have PC Morris with them? I I don't, I think PC Morris is the love child of these people. Quite gruesomely, May, who, as we said, was not involved, went to the fortune of war and was at the bar later in the evening of that day and was seen cleaning a set of human teeth. Jolly. And boasting that he expected to get two pounds for them. Sure enough, the next day he goes to a local dentist, he sells a set of teeth, only gets 12 shillings. Whereas Bishops and Williams had enlisted the help of Michael Shields, a porter, to help them shift a large object. They would use a hamper left at the gates of St. Bart's Hospital. Literally, this is what happens at the, the hospitals of the time. They just leave hampers by the gate and go, if a body turns up in them, then what's the harm? So they just go and get this hamper I'll see you that. You say you say hamper being left at the gates. I'm expecting to open the hamper and there's be some nice cake and some cheese, maybe a <laughs> bottle of wine, some lovely things. But no, it's full of dead people. It's full of dead. This people. is not the hamper I want. It's full of feet. <laughs> oh God, there's no better. I want a nice hamper full of loveliness. Nice loveliness. <laughs> Bishop and May made for Guy's Hospital, where May had previously had success in selling two bodies, but they were turned away as the school had enough corpses. <laughs> oh, we're full of corpses. Full Thank of corpses much. today. They eventually arrive at King's College School of Anatomy. Hammered! Absolutely (laughs) wrecked by now. Introduced to the anatomist Richard Partridge and his staff. Uh, Richard Partridge, quite a good anatomist. He did famously fail to spot a bullet in Garibaldi's knee or his ankle (laughs) later in his life. He was called in to actually... Yeah, this is the thing about... This is the guy later on just massively fucked up Garibaldi's (laughs) diagnosis. Partridge is reluctant to deal with these men. They, mm. they are ke- clearly drunk. This porter says, no, no, they usually give good bodies. Uh, take the thing. The body was always described as a thing mm. in common parlance around there saying, oh, I've got a thing. I'm going to sell something for a thing. They agree a price of nine guineas at first. May starts shouting drunkenly going, I want ten. Ah, oh, ten guineas. Bishop is just whispering going, "Just he's drunk, he's drunk, ignore him. They go off, they bring the corpse back. More drinks via various <laughs> pubs on the way. Quite right. Shields is also drunk with them as well, the porter. Hired to carry the hamper, absolutely hammered, staggering with an unbeknownst to him dead body <laughs> in a hamper across London. La 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 la. To King's College. And they open the hamper and they literally tip out the body mm. onto the floor. 
Nice. They shake it out of the sack and there this body lies. Richard Partridge is immediately disturbed by this delivery. One would hope so. Yeah, (laughs) it's clearly a young boy. There are no obvious signs of clay apart from a couple of very well-placed smears on the body that would indicate that he has been dug up. Mm. So he clearly hasn't been buried. There is a gash across his forehead. His grey eyes are bloodshot. All of his teeth are missing and he could see he has been, he sustained injuries on the head. So whether the child had been hit at any point or... He just bashed his head as going down the well or something. Exactly. And when he asked the men what had caused the boy's death, Bishop said, I neither know nor care. It is quite indifferent what he died of. Here he is, stiff enough. So Partridge, (laughs) to his credit, goes, I only have a 50 pound note. I need to go and get change. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to which May is going, no, I'll take the 50. I'll take the totally 50, give you money. I'd totally give him money letter. It's absolutely fine. Of course, he goes, he comes back, not with a £50 note in change. He comes back with the police. Good for him. Bishop, Williams, May and Shields are all arrested for murder. A coroner's jury was held on the 8th of November. During the inquest, Bishop and May jeered throughout the proceedings, <laughs> laughing at the evidence, seemingly unconcerned about doing themselves more damage, yeah. contradicting them, shouting things out, not bothered at all. Not the smartest chaps, are they? The coroner found a verdict of murder as the cause of death. In the meantime, the police have been searching Nova Scotia gardens. They've searched the property. They found a mass of clothing hidden around the property, buried, stuffed down the privy, in the <laughs> well, everywhere it's like just sell why do you yeah sell it burn it get rid of it now the media obviously embraced the story not Mm. only have we got body snatchers on our hands but it's the slaughter of this angelic immigrant child Mm. this poor child has been put into the system it's awful railing against the monsters who sought to profit from him the italian boy murder is what the headlines would read Mm. but at the trial and in william's subsequent confession he claims that carlo ferrari wasn't from italy at all he was a drover from Lincolnshire. <laughs> okay. So how this was confused, I know not. Yeah. It's just what Williams had said. And he said, no, I don't know Carlo Ferrari. I've never seen a boy with white mice. We just got this guy and we killed him. And yes, he was a teenager. But the media ignore all of this. Isn't it far better? This poor child that so many noble people, again, in Smithfield as well, people attested to seeing mm. with white mice standing on the street. And some people positively identified him. And then they retracted it later. Mm. They were kind of a bit like, no, this is this poor child on the street. (laughs) It's a much better story. It's a much better story. So in the conclusion is that Bishop, who was 33 at the time, Williams, who was 26, and May, aged 30, were all found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. Shields Mm. was... Uh, exonerated he was just carrying shit yeah absolutely he yeah. didn't, he know, didn't what know what was going didn't on. Know going on and apparently the windows were opened in the court when the judgment was passed so the public outside could hear the <laughs> sentence of death now may continually protested his innocence saying i i am a grave robber but i am not a murderer he protests and protests and protests he never committed any murders william and bishop later gave a detailed confession about the murders they'd committed and the two other murders that i'd mentioned before the boy and the two others and they spoke about it in detail and they exonerated may they said no it's not he had nothing to do with the murders he just moved stuff around he sold the teeth god damn it so he was spared the gallows his his judgment was overturned he reportedly fainted at the news oh yeah quite happy with that one yeah yeah, he (laughs) thought he was gonna die and then he was just like oh the joy (laughs) yep Bishops and Williams went to the gallows on the 5th of December, 1831. Mm. Both said, having given their confessions, that they had nothing more to add. And Williams was particularly stricken, saying, I deserve it. Crimes that I have done, I am ready to die. 30,000 people were gathered to watch the hangings. (laughs) People climbing up lamppost, gathering on rooftops. Yep, hiding in the wells. Bishops died instantly. Williams hanged there for five minutes, strangled. There was one account that I read about the executioner was famously inept just what you want in an executioner well actually <laughs> famously all, useless <laughs> all the crowd wanted it that's well, what they wanted so, to yeah. show they didn't want, want them to suffer a quick snap of the neck mm. they got it with williams and of course of course of course of course their bodies were donated oh, to scientific absolutely. research and apparently bishops was an amazing subject because mm. he was so muscular and well, so fit and healthy yeah. from dragging bodies lots around. and lots of carrying dead people around so it's going to build up the muscle isn't it yeah so <laughs> the final legacy of this story is that the ferrari that 
that the case caused, combined with the events of the Burke and Hare case, led to the passing of the Anatomy Act in 1831. Now, it's not what you would think. It wasn't people, it wasn't an act that said, stop robbing grave no, and selling not. bodies. It's very much illegal. This is awful. It was more that bodies could be donated to science. Yes. So beforehand, just murderers. Now it was if bodies you... donated to science legally obtained for anatomical study families could donate them so it doesn't cut off the resurrectionists immediately no but it's going to put a dent in like supply and demand really isn't it it's going to be a lot more supply out there legitimately obtainable yeah and over the next 10 years or so the the body snatching lost its shine and the offers of money dried up and in the end dead bodies ceased to be a very weird source of income oh very good story of the london burkers nice there you go later called in the press Yes, inspired, I'm sure not instantly called that. Inspired um, by Burke and Hare, but they said, yeah, yeah they, they were which inspired one, Burke by and Hare, which is the one who was never heard of again? Burke was the one who was hanged. Right, so Hare was the one who escaped and was never known of. Yes, I So perhaps so. he went to London he and went started to London. all up all again. Oh my God. And called the gang after his best mate. <gasps> he could have. Solved he it. He could have. There you go. They ah. all had aliases. Mm. So they could have moved around as much as they liked. But they didn't use the burking technique. In a well. In a well. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, them a, in wells. that's a random method mm. to choose. Tie the feet together, put them down a well. So there's no obvious signs of injury or anything. If you whack someone over the head, there's going to be a big hole. So people are going to go, there's a hole in the head. But I that's suppose. the point, is that you yeah, have so to kill them in a way that doesn't look like I have just not murdered immediately this person. Obvious, yeah. It looks like they've died of natural causes. And they wanted to get the laudanum out of their system. So that... That, that's what they said they did in Williams and Bishop's confessions they mm. both said that they had done that Williams was more detailed but it was him mm. saying this is this is what we did this is how we killed them you'd have thought lungs full of water would have been more obvious than what? laudanum in the blood or well, if it was in the drink in the digestive system yeah. yeah I don't that I don't know I haven't looked it up about whether if you're drowned upside down well you're still going to try and breathe aren't well, you yeah, so you're, you're still going to say you're going to still take water in into your lungs whether whatever way up you are but then they're drunks and they're vagrants rolled into the Thames yeah potentially yes I suppose people do yeah just stumble and fall and things into a puddle yeah. or into, yeah, into the Thames and things and they're not using so. that well for water that's well fixed. thank god for that no yeah. that's just awful <laughs> the- Children go out, yeah, the, Daddy, the, let's make the, tea. The, the, no! wife, the wife come down. I need to make the tea. Can you get this body out of here? <laughs> so there you go. The continuation of the yeah. body snatching tales and the mm. famous London burkers. Mm, very good. Yes. And mm. the pubs that they all used to frequent. Many, many, many pubs. I think we need to do a bit of a pub visitation of all of those pubs. It's sad the Fortune of War is that not is, there anymore. That is sad. That is sad. Some of the others, uh, I think, are around, but most of them are, most of them are yeah. gone. Sadly, because this was a slum. Yes, indeed. Now it's very fashionable. Yeah. So... Mm. In conclusion, a couple of things in conclusion. Yes. So, the old friend, a good cocktail. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. That went down beautifully. Definitely worth a go. Give it a, well, the recipe will be out this evening. So, uh, do try it out and let us know how you get on. To end this episode, we're giving you something a little bit different. A little different. A little different. So, um, as some of you know, me, I'm in a band called The Demon Gin. And we do lots of lovely songs about macabre things and murder and horribleness. And one of the songs that we have done and we recorded was a song about the fortune of war. Now, this was a song originally written and created by another local band called The Chimney Boys, uh, who Greg Island was a member of. He's in The Demon Gin as well. And when The Demon Gin was formed, Greg said, why don't we cover this song? Uh, I can assure you that I'm in the process of setting up a band camp for The Demon Gin. Thank you for everyone who's messaged about that. So you'll be able to listen to this song online if you want to support the band. This song is on SoundCloud if you want to listen to it under The Demon Gin. We will fade out our episode this week with a little musical interlude. Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Bye-bye.
so many friends who'll be delighted just to see you And we don't need to tell you what they'll do You'll soon be feeling lonely when the lamplight fades to black And all the prayers in Christendom would never bring you back So we'll liberate you later with a shovel and a sack You're gonna feel a resurrection blue Thank you. 